If like me you've got a massive shaft, sometimes you'll find yourself asking, where do I put this? Hi folks, Matt Easton here, Scully Laditor, and I'm here with my massive war spear. That's right, it's got a thick shaft, um, it's girthy, it's got a massive pointy reinforced head on it. This is a blunt one for reenactment. Obviously I've got sharp ones as well, you've seen those in previous videos. And I have been talking a lot about spears recently and there's a number of reasons for that. Number one is because I'm preparing to go to an event where this is going to be my primary ar armament. That's right, I'm uh, kind of dabbling in the world of living history and I have decided that this particular weapon is going to be my primary because I kind of thought, you know, if I was going to war, um, in full harness or not, I'm going to choose a pole arm as my primary weapon, unless I'm an archer, which uh, frankly I'm not up to these days. Um, so I'm going to choose a pole arm of some kind as my primary weapon, and I know that a lot of my opponents are going to be using bills. Now, I could choose a bill, and there's nothing wrong with a bill. However, it has to be said in a reenactment context, you can't really use things like bills and halberds and Dane axes in a particularly authentic way according to the treatises that um, that I study whereas spears you can use them relatively safely because you can do all of the same techniques you do with them you just pull your thrusts a bit um, but you cannot give someone a full power whack with a Dane axe or a, or a halberd or a bill in a reenactment context because you'll kill them it doesn't really matter if the weapon's blunt they're going to go down if you hit them with it. So um, you can use them lightly, you can use them carefully, symbolically, but you can't really use them with very many techniques. And I consider a big girthy spear is probably my better bet. There's another reason why I've chosen a big girthy spear, and that is um, because it gives me a reach advantage over the people with bills. And I know only too often in a reenactment, people with bills will be trying to hook my legs or hook other bits of my armour. And um, being able to shove them away uh, at a greater reach with a big thick spear is a good idea. But even if I was fighting in a real war, these aren't just weapons of low class soldiers. I think a lot of people out there think that spears are simply low class weapons uh, for people who can't afford something better and that you'd be better off with um, something like a pole axe uh, like this if you were a knight and indeed some people I've even seen say oh well you're you know you're a knight you've got full harness uh, you shouldn't be using a spear you should be using a, uh, a pole axe Poppy cup. Look at look at the look at the sources. Okay, the fact is, if you look at the sources of uh, fully armoured knights in the 15th century, yes, indeed, sometimes they've got pole axes. Sometimes, very often, in fact, they have a spear, which is indeed sometimes the lance that they'd use on horseback, simply redeployed to foot use. So the spear is very much still a knightly weapon, uh, even when you're wearing full plate harness. The other reason I've been thinking a lot about spears recently. I mean, I think about spears all the time. <laughs> But the other reason is because I recently did, you've probably seen uh, a video on Insider um, channel, uh, Business Insider, and, and basically I talked about pole arms featured in movies. And, you know, they got me on because I talk about pole arms a lot anyway, but this has also got me to thinking about it. Now, in the comments underneath that video, loads of really, really good comments, and it was great as well because I was getting comments from people who don't normally know my channel or watch my channel, so I was getting different types of questions, different types of observations. And one of those uh, particularly picked my uh, interest, and I thought, do you know what? This is a great question to ask for uh, reenactors, people who do LARP, people who do um, even, you know, HEMA people, although HEMA people don't normally think about questions like this. People who play video games or role-playing games particularly, or people who write novels. Could be historic novels, fantasy novels, don't really matter. That is, what do you do with your spear, with your whopping great uh, shaft, your massive wood that you've got? What do you do with it in a situation where you can't have it in your hand. Um, and there are many reasons why you might not have it in your hand. It could be that you're in combat and uh, the press is so close that you want to drop this weapon and pull out a sword or a dagger and use that. Or it could just simply be a civilian, well, kind of semi-civilian traveling uh, situation whereby this massive thing is your primary. I can't even put this upright, it's so tall. Uh, this is your primary weapon but you can't go into a tavern with it. You might not even be able to go uh, through a fortified gateway with it. You might not be allowed with it because it's a weapon of war. Um, 
So there's legal reasons and practical reasons. Uh, obviously, there's all sorts of buildings you wouldn't be able to go to into with this. Um, but as I say, there are sometimes legal reasons in medieval Europe. And this might be even if you're looking at a fantasy environment. This is a very common thing we see in many societies where weapons of war, so a sidearm, a sword might be allowed or a dagger might be allowed, but a, th something like a spear or a lance or a halberd, you might not be allowed to wander around the streets with it because the local rulers are a bit worried about the people rising up and overthrowing them. So they say, well, you can, you can wear a sword, but you can't walk around with a halberd or a spear. That's, that's completely uh, unacceptable. Um, so it could be legal reasons, but mostly, practical reasons. The simple fact is, yes, this is a wonderful weapon to have in your hand and be using as a weapon in a fight, but you're not always doing that. The fact is your weapons spend most of their time not being used to fight with. Your weapons most of the time are being used to carry around or they're being worn at your side or whatever. So what do you do what do you do with your spear or your any other pole arm when you're not using it? Well, I think the battle one is that we'll address that first or kind of combat one. Quite simply, you drop it, okay? And at some point you're gonna to have to retrieve it. Now, funnily enough, I have wondered, you know, I imagine that well-heeled people probably invested more money in their spears or, you know, uh, pole axes than people who were maybe issued their weapons um, and, if you're, even if you're a wealthy man at arms with your beloved Polax, and at some point during that battle, you decide to abandon the Polax because in that particular close in pressed melee, your sword or your dagger might be a better weapon. At some point, assuming you survive and your side wins, you're gonna be looking for your Polax again. Now in that situation, identification, and anybody who does archery and has marked uh, their arrows, either the fletchings or the shafts, will be familiar with this. Identification is very, very important to say, that's, that's my Polax, mate, that you're picking up. Uh, can I have that back, please? When well, he says, whoa, I think that's mine. How do you know it's yours? And you can go, because it's got the letter M on the underneath of the uh, hammer head and he goes ah shit yeah sorry mate here you go uh so identification even if it's just other people like your retainers who are hopefully crowded around you protecting you um even if they go uh oi uh, that's that's my boss's polax give that here and they get it back for you identification of weapons is important obviously with something like a polax it's somewhat easier uh when we've got something like a a shafted weapon they're all going to look more similar aren't they so I have wondered, is identification important? Uh, would they have wanted their particular spear back? I kind of think yes, because if you're, as I say, if you're well healed, you know, if you've invested in your weapon and you know that's got a good hardened steel um, spearhead on it, you trust it, you know that the wood's been well selected, well seasoned, um, you're not going to want to pick up some random old spear from some, you know, some lowly um, kind of someone's retinue over there. You're not going to want a crappy spear, you're going to want your good spear back. So, I do think that in battle you pretty much have to drop things and then try and find them later. But the finding of them later is an interesting thing that I think it's worth acknowledging. And if you're writing novels or uh, designing games, doing role playing games or even LARP or whatever, the process of identifying which weapon is yours afterwards and finding it in the big heap of weapons lying on the ground is perhaps an interesting thing, and something you could use as a story point. Okay, so that's the that's the kind of war um, aspect. I think basically you drop it. There is one other aspect of what to do with a pole arm. Uh, uh, now, funnily enough, this is actually mentioned in a 19th century source with uh, uh, Napoleonic. So actually, it could be late 18th century, but anyway, it's a Napoleonic source that mentions French lancers, and it describes so lancers traditionally in the Napoleonic era, and you can apply this to earlier eras and other um, areas of the world usually had a sidearm uh, such as a sword, okay? And the simple fact is because when, even when you're mounted on a horse with a lance, there comes a point where your lance might get knocked out of your hand, might get embedded in an opponent's body or in their horse, or you, you drop it or it breaks or whatever, so you need a backup weapon. So traditionally, lancers had swords. And in this situation, the particular lancers in question get into a close melee with British cavalry, and they pull their swords out because they find they can't move, they can't maneuver their horses around and basically they want to be able to hack and slash with their swords, which is more easy to do in a close press than trying to use a lance. And rather than simply dropping them, what do they do? Yes, yeah, some of you may have already worked this out. They think, well, I want to draw my sword. I've got to get rid of this. 
I may as well lob it into the enemy ranks. Uh, so this is obviously particularly applicable to something like a spear. But at a push, could you throw the pointy end of a pole axe into the enemy ranks? Well, yeah, why not? So actually, if you make a decision and if you have the space and the, the time to do it, turning your pole axe or your spear around and just hurling it as hard as you can do into the enemy formation before you then pull your sword or dagger out, uh, why not do it? And I, and I think they would have done it. And my evidence for this is that when we look at the medieval treatises, for example, Fiore or Talhofer, we see throwing of the longsword. And a lot of people go, why would you throw a longsword? I've addressed this in previous videos, but one of the reasons is because you want to draw your dagger. Now, if you're holding a longsword and you want to draw a dagger, why just drop it on the ground? Why not just hurl it at the enemy as you charge in and then pull your dagger? It's a distraction. It might kill them. It might wound them. Whatever, it's doing something rather than doing something completely redundant and passive. So I do think sometimes, yeah, pole arms probably most of the time were dropped, but there's nothing to stop you if you've got the space to do it, hurling that spear into the enemy ranks as you pull your sword out. So there's combat for you. And I think there'd be some differentiation between how close the press is, whether it's a battle or skirmish, just a combat in the street, street fighting between a few people, whatever. Um, but that might give you some things to think about. So now onto the question of what do you do with your pole arm, be it a spear, pole axe, whatever, if you can't take it into the environment that you're going into, if you're charging into a house where some of the enemy have hidden or you're just traveling peacefully and you arrive at your destination and you want to go into an inn get some drink, have your horse um, uh, fed and all of that kind of stuff. Maybe you want to stay for the night. What do you do with the pole arms? Now, anybody who's ever seen medieval buildings, um, and if you live in my part of the world, I highly recommend you visit the Weald and Downland Museum, uh, open air museum, which is essentially where they've taken lots of uh, historical buildings that were going to be demolished or otherwise were in the way and they've picked them up, taken them apart and they've relocated them to this open air museum and you can walk around medieval and uh, Tudor, Renaissance all the way through to 19th century um, buildings, a lot of them uh, rural or village or small town, uh, so not generally speaking city kind of civic buildings but small, the kind of houses that a medieval merchant or a medieval lord or just a medieval uh, farmer might have lived in. Now, the one thing you'll notice about them is they're small. Even people who were really wealthy in the 15th century didn't live in particularly big houses by modern standards. So they might own acres and acres of land. They might own hundreds of acres of land, but very often the actual house that they lived in might not be particularly big. Now, a lot of you will be shouting, but what about castles? Well, yeah, okay, castles can be big, but very often the accommodation part of castles, the actual bits that you live in, if you visit a large castle like Porchester Castle or, um, I don't know, Pembroke Castle, and you actually go into the rooms, in some cases, these are rooms that kings and queens dwelled in. The actual rooms themselves, the chambers, aren't particularly big. Um, so, yes, indeed, the surface area of the castle might be big, but the individual living accommodation is not very big by modern standards at all. So don't think about a modern mansion, think about something more like an average size house by modern standards being the top echelons. And of course common people would live in very small houses in some cases. So kind of two up, two down, or two, two down and no two up. Um, so what do you do with your pole arms? Well it's tricky isn't it? Now there is some anecdotal evidence that for storage, so if you're actually going to your own home for example, that pole arms and indeed things like longbows and any other long objects were sometimes stored up in the rafters. Okay. Now there are many advantages to doing this, one of those being that it's relatively dry up there, certainly if your thatch or um, tiles or whatever your, is on your roof are uh, well maintained, then storing it up in the roof, and in fact in my garage here, my poles, I think they're just off, out of shot, but they're actually stored high up. It keeps them high up, it keeps them dry away from the damp and that kind of stuff. The problem with standing things on the ground is they will naturally draw dampness up and they will rot at the bottom in many medieval housing uh, kind of situations. Um, the other danger of course is anything, it's not so much of a problem with the spear, but but anything which has a weighty head on it, you've got a dilemma because if you lean it against something with the head, bill head, pole axe head, halberd, whatever, upwards, there's always the danger it can fall and injure someone. <laughs> uh, I've seen this happen. Uh, it's quite risky. So your next option is to go, oh, well, okay, I'll put the dangerous end, the heavy end, I'll put it at the bottom and it's less likely to fall over. You can do that, 
Two risks with that. Number one, you can quite easily kick the bottom end that's sticking out and knock into it. But additionally, that end's gonna get rusty because it's now on the damp ground. So, problematic. So these are more likely and more safely stored Again, high up on a wall, in the rafters, or over a fireplace. That's the other place where things were often stored because, again, it was dry. And combating damp and dealing with damp in medieval buildings is a really big issue. So, for example, salt, which was extremely expensive and imported, um, but looked after and um, often in a, in a block or a kind of cone shape, salt was often stored in a recess next to or in the fireplace because it kept it dry okay and kept it from getting damp and being ruined so uh preservation and looking after things and if you've got a particularly good piece of wood that's nice and dry and you want it to be reliable you don't want it to break in combat you don't want it to rot you don't want it to get mold on it all of this kind of stuff and you've got a steel head you don't want to get rusty and you want to stay sharp blah 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 you want it to be high up in a dry place somewhere so if you're at home i would say generally these would be stored usually high up on a wall, in the rafters, that kind of thing. And we, in fact, there are some images from the 15th century of an armory where there are halberds. This is, I think, German or Austrian, I can't remember which. And halberds are absolutely racked on the walls. Uh, so that's how they were stored in armories for all the reasons I've just mentioned. Now, what if you were a traveler? Well, we don't really know. This is the interesting one. So, and you could apply this to a role-playing game or LARP or uh, a novel or just, you know, history, historical interpretation or reenactment, living history. What did people do when they travelled somewhere with a polearm? Well, there's some anecdotal evidence that the stacking or piling of arms uh, in a camp, for example, that we later see done with muskets and bayonets or rifles and bayonets, was perhaps done with certain types of polearm. And if a polearm has projecting bits on the head, such as a halberd poleaxe or bill or something like that, you can interlink a bunch of them and have them standing there in a sort of cone, okay? Almost like a tree of, of, of weapons. And again, that keeps them off the ground, it keeps them damp, and it's as long as everyone grabs them at the same time so they don't fall over sideways, you can access them pretty quickly and easily. It can be a little bit precarious, I have to say. I've seen people um, piling, stacking muskets and bayonets, and it's quite easy to make them fall over, but anyway. So that's one possibility. However, if you're arriving, so that's a camp, that's a military camp, um, and you know, the other thing is tents, okay? Theoretically, you could lean these weapons, and I've seen it done in reenactment camps, lean these weapons up against the side of tents, and that's fairly secure because the tent tends to sag uh, where the weapon's leaning against it and hold it upright. You could point it, put it point up, point down. I think for people who want sharp weapons in good serviceable order. You see how much I'm struggling with the size of this pole arm in here. It's quite a good illustration of the issue. Um, people who want sharp effective pole arms tend to want to have the steel far away from the ground. Okay, but you've got to bear in mind it, it might rain anyway. Although you can cover this in oil or grease or butter or lard or something like that. And olive oil, that will protect it. Um, now, so that's in terms of a military camp. So I kind of think the military camp is the easiest one to answer. The difficult one to answer, which I don't really have an answer to, is what did people do if they were traveling with pole arms and they arrived at either an inn or a tavern or, um, you know, so they were travelers and staying somewhere for the night or um, they arrived at a city? And I don't honestly know. Now, in all of the records I've studied, there are descriptions of when you, if you're carrying weapons, and it usually applies to swords, when you arrive at the place you're staying at, for example, in London or Paris, then you're supposed to put your weapon into lodgings, essentially, with the innkeeper, and they will look after the weapons so you're not wandering around the streets with them. Um, so that's Okay, you can imagine how they may be stored swords. Maybe if you turned up with a halberd or a spear, the innkeeper would have provision for that. Remember, of course, that a lot of travellers had horses. Now, horse stables are fairly large, so it's entirely possible that things like this would be stored in the horse's stables, either stood up against the wall or again stuck up on beams or in the rafters. Um, so I think that's one possibility. I think that they would be put wherever you leave your horse, you'd leave your pole arm. Now, a lot of people, I think, certainly in, if you think of a sort of scenario based or a role playing game based thing, you might think, well, if you just leave your pole arm lying around, isn't it going to get stolen? And you kind of think, well, but they had, they'd already dealt with this issue for horses. So if you've arrived at a town or a city or a village or whatever, or a tavern, 
they will have somewhere to look after your horses and your horses will be looked after by stable hands and other staff who are around who are there to feed and water the horses deal with their um, shoes or hooves if necessary or perhaps brush them down that kind of stuff dry them off if they've been rained on and those people are going to be manning that area and essentially keeping it safe because otherwise someone would steal your horse and the horse is very much more valuable than a spear at least most spears unless it's an extremely ornate one so I kind of think that probably, and this is my guess, if you arrive at an inn, a tavern, a settlement, a city, a castle even, whatever, with a pole arm, be it a lance or a spear or a halberd or poleaxe or whatever, then probably it would be left wherever your horse was left. Now another little nugget to think about for the people who are writing novels or making role-playing games. Therefore, if you want to get to your pole arm, if you're suddenly attacked in the tavern or uh, you need to flee because you've been accused of a crime you didn't do or any other kind of scenarios you can think of, you have to remember that you have to get from wherever you're staying, you have to access your sidearms, which might have been lodged with the innkeeper, so your sidearm might not be in the place where you're staying. And this could apply to medieval soldiers travelling to the muster point. For example, Battle of Agincourt uh, campaign they mustered at um, Porchester Castle, which I mentioned before, down on the south coast um, near uh, Portsmouth. And in that case, soldiers travelled from all over England and Wales, uh, perhaps even in some cases Ireland and Scotland, and I think basically at that time it would have been England and Wales, would have travelled from all over the country, all the way down to the south coast. So on that route, that would have taken them in some cases, maybe a couple of weeks to get there, um, depending on whether they had a horse or not. Um, and so they would have had to stay in places. They maybe sometimes would have camped in the woods, but very often they would have stayed at inns on the way and this kind of stuff. What did they do with their weapons? Well, in theory, their weapons would have had to stay with the uh, innkeeper or the place, uh, the person who owned the establishment they were staying at. So they might not be near all of their weapons. They'd probably be near their dagger and stuff like that. And probably in some cases their sword, but not always, not if it was a city. But anything like um, lances or bills or uh, spears or even longbows perhaps may have been kept where the horses were kept or somewhere else. So um, you have to think about... Uh, if you're thinking about a, a fictional scenario, how does that character get to their weapons if they've got to get to them quickly because they might not be near them? It might not be a simple matter to get to them. But I want to conclude by saying, whilst these are wonderful weapons and in a HEMA context, we go to a class and we go, oh, we're going to do spear tonight and we turn up with the spears and we, we uh, fight with them, we fence with them and then we put them in the car and we drive home again. Transporting these around, whether on foot or on horse and living with them day to day is a massive great nuisance and there are many ways of carrying spears obviously you can lean them on your on your shoulder and go like this there is also mentions of trailing pikes where you carry it at the pointy end and literally just drag it behind almost like a dog on a lead to drag it behind you there are various ways of carrying and transporting them but they are a nuisance and when you're thinking about either historical or fictional situations where people lived with large long weapons like this think about how did they transport them in what scenarios can they have them and can't they have them? And when they can't have them, what do they do with them? I think it's an interesting question. I hope this has been thought provoking for some of you. Um, give me a like, please, if you watched the video, uh, share it around. And if you haven't subscribed, please make sure you've done so. I'll see you back on the channel really soon for another video. Cheers, folks. Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers, folks.